things uh, that I look at, um, some of the huge strides it's made in VR, and it's such a very short amount of time. VR being? Virtual reality, um, headsets, um, uh, fit dealing with the latency <laughs> issue and how latency is becoming less of an issue. Uh, it could soon be all about content, or maybe the length of experience. Um, also looking at venture, seeing how venture is rethinking some of ed tech. And, um, but that doesn't mean it's going away. I think where they put their money, and how they think about apps, and whether to invest in ed tech in apps specifically is changing. Just two tough things off the top of my mind. Yeah. And I, I want to um, urge everyone here to stick your head in uh, an inoculus at some point within, you know, we should have really brought one, but at least the Google Cardboard. Because the latency issue that Scott's talking about means you don't get dizzy and sick anymore, and when you put on the noise-canceling headphones, it's a really intense experience. And as a former fifth grade teacher, I think having that tool to put kids in a little cone of silence, it's, you know, what they do to tor torture people, <laughs> which is kind of what you do as a fifth grade teacher. So you have a new psychological mechanism that Oculus could put your kid's head in anything. And you can use it for behavioral goals or developmental, you know, constructivist goals. So it's a really fascinating tool that can exist. Uh, Barry. Uh, I'm Barry. I'm with Story Toys. Um, I'm a VR skeptic. But That's okay. We'll talk about that over the next few days. Um, particularly when it comes to kids. So highlights and lowlights? Yes. Okay. Uh, our, our highlight was definitely our Bologna win, um, uh, thanks to Emma and his team, with uh, My Very Hungry Caterpillar, which you, you'll learn more about over the next uh, day or two. Um, lowlights, I think, are probably lowlights everybody shares here. It's a really tough space to be in, in the kids' app space. Business models are hard, there's a lot of content on the deck, very, very hard to make money in this space. So hopefully we'll get to talk about that over the next few days as well. I'm John Crummy with uh, Touch Press in London, and um, I wasn't here last year, so I'm not sure I can legitimately talk too much about um, what's happened during the year. But um, I, I do have two two main areas of interest. Um, I think that are very topical at the moment, and um, one of those is where apps are actually going. And I think, in my view, we are very much at the beginning of apps rather than in the middle and in some ways I think this is an industry that is just starting to emerge and we are fiddling around the edges with these two-dimensional devices at the moment and the um, technology is going to, um, te technology landscape is going to change extremely rapidly and we need to be I think prepared for that and thinking about that now um, about what that actually means for the children's interactive experience and there are lots of positives but lots of areas of deep concern as well and those areas of concern are areas that it would be interesting to explore during during this conference the other um, thing that I've always wondered is why children's apps tend to be so much biased towards younger children and there does seem to be a gap somewhere between about 9 and 12 and um, where there doesn't seem to be a huge amount of innovation and um, I'm kind of interested in why that's the case and what can be done to, to address that really interesting time in, in children's lives. Thank you. Hi, I'm Harley Baldwin. I'm the VP of Design at Shell Games. Um, let's see, what's been going on this year? Well, uh, we've been making a lot of games for the 9 to 11 year old space. Um, and that has been a very interesting experience. Um, there's a reason, I think, that a lot of people don't take it on. It's very challenging. The developmental uh, levels there are so wildly different that it, it's very hard and also being able to reasonably address any kind of standards um, and to provide teachers with the curriculum and classroom management that they need. Um, it, there's a lot there, and so it's, more, it's a lot more than just developing an app. Uh, also, I'm on the VR train. Um, uh, 
And there are a lot of things, there are a lot of challenges to VR with kids' interactive experiences. Um, just first and foremost, as a mother, I look at my children and I see that physically they do not have excellent judgment. They fall off of things and they trip on things. And if you cover their eyes, they lose their balance. And um, so there are some safety issues there that we have to address in some way before that can become a real thing. Um, but they also recognize magic faster than we do. And VR is magic. Uh, and so finding a way to make that useful and accessible to them, I think, is, is going to be a real game changer for us. Thanks. Um, I'm Michelle Kripalani with Ocean House Media. Uh, I'd say the first five years of the app space for us was uh, getting quantity out in the space to make sure we'd have enough of a financial foundation to get where we were going. The last year we've seen a lot of erosion in terms of being able to sell straight paid apps. So we've actually invested a lot in subscription apps. And we've also realized that a lot of our catalog got long in the tooth. And so we've rebooted a lot of our engines and done a lot of redevelopment from the ground up. Um, so those are two aspects. And the third aspect we spent a lot of time on in the last 12 months is in um, marketing and funnels and growth hacking and the kinds of things that are related to really, really selling products other than just putting it on the app store and hoping that it's going to get featured. By the way, what time is it? Well, just so that's the other exciting thing for me for this year, I guess, but not related to kids. Well, I just uh, want to know what time it was. It's 8.38. Okay. Well, you <laughs> so, didn't look at your watch. What's up with that? Huh? Did you look? I did. It didn't flash on right away. Oh. What? It's, uh, sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. <laughs> I'm yeah. just noticing there's a few Apple Watches up here. Yeah. So we're, all, we're investing in the Apple Watch, but nothing related to kids. Uh, we do have a, we had a launch app on the Apple Watch. Cool. Uh, I'm Dan Russell Pinson, and... Uh, this is my fifth uh, app count, which is hard to believe. Feels like the second. Uh, no, uh, yeah. So I, I, I actually do address the 9 to 11 uh, age range. That's been that's always been my uh, thing. Um, it just suits my skills. I, I guess one good thing I've seen in the last year is it seems like um, we've been able. A lot of us have been able to raise our prices which I, I've noticed, and uh, looking at the like top 10, top 20 charts, like in education, a lot of them are 2.99 or something like that, where you know three or four years ago, it was all 99 cents, and I've been able to raise the prices on my apps. And so that's been a, that's been a very positive thing. Uh, I don't know why that is, but, but I think that's a good thing. Um, negatives, I, I, I'm, I've been burned out for the last <laughs> three months. <laughs> I haven't been working for a few months. Uh, after five or six years of just burning it out. Um, so I've been taking a break. So if, if I'm out of the loop, that's probably, probably why. But I'll be representing the independent developer uh, in Pierre as well. That might be one of the bigger statements that you've heard tonight, so. <laughs> so. <laughs> Thanks. I'm Mark Schlichting from Noodleworks. And um, the downside that I see these days is that we're in a mature market and we watch this We've seen this cycle happen. We saw it in floppy disk, we saw it in CD-ROMs, we saw it in the internet. It's about these seven, eight year cycles. And now we're in the sixth year of coming in from the iPhone and into the iPad. And, you know, it becomes harder and harder for smaller developers, even with great products, to break in unless you have the marketing or you're another bigger way to do it. And I'm always looking at where, where we're going into the next, what's the next piece? And part of it certainly is that there's VR, but there's a lot of questions, like you said, Barry, that apply to, and you were saying that really apply to younger kids. I can't think of my grandkids doing it, but on the other hand, I know that we're going there. I can feel it. And, um, the other thing that I think is uh, a convergence I see happening is, is video. Video, we know how popular um, YouTube is. I, somebody was giving me the numbers today about, what was it, Eileen? 20% of all internet capacity is devoted to YouTube. Which is pretty darn amazing, and you know, and what percentage of that is kids? And so, I think that there's a big, there's, a, it's another play pattern that kids love video and they love those little pieces. And, and Jordan's going there, and other people I know are interested in trying to figure that out because we're not really ready for interactive TV yet. 
um, but there's still something really powerful about it. So there, that seems to be one of the other openings. And then I think multi-touch still hasn't been really played out. I know you, um, your group, the Sagasago group, did somebody, and he was talking about how hard that was to do to get that to work. And I know um, other people have been working on their multi-touch pieces too. So it seems like there's still multi multi-touch things that we could do that we haven't got to yet. And that's those are all places I'm kind of interested in looking at. Okay, I'm Bjorn from Taka Boca. Um, I think encouraging things happening this year. I think for us it's been a year of sort of growing up a little bit and getting more professional, building out my American team and uh, sort of we've been trying to internationalize to a high degree and sort of fully understand what it means to enter markets like Japan and Brazil and what you need to do and how you need to change both the marketing and organization and everything from that. Um, I think on the product side, it's also a bit of growing up, trying to do some things which we always talked about but didn't really have time to do before. So I think Token Nature was a good example of an experimental thing that was going for a completely different kind of emotion than just a laugh. So trying to get this sort of sense of being in nature somehow, that was sort of an interesting thing for us during the last year on the product side. Um, so if that's encouraging and, and fun, discouraging, less fun, um, I think just realizing the size of the market and how small it is still. Um, you know, being in an extremely privileged position of being in the top of it, I also can see how small it is. <laughs> um, which is maybe not the most encouraging of words, but it's, you know, um, I, I realize it's still great to be there, but that was a bit of an eye opener uh, to a higher degree than maybe I'd, I'd fully understood before. Uh, I'm Pierre from Escapadou. And just to continue what we say, you say, you say it's a small market, but um, it's always um, uh, amazing because the toys market, the real toys market, I mean, it's, it's really big, it's huge. And so people, they don't want to pay or they don't want to buy a lot of apps currently. So um, I don't know why exactly. Uh, it's really amazing, for example, on Android, how people are not buying stuff. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, if you, if you talk with people that are doing Android and uh, iOS, they, they, I think they all tell you that uh, it's between 10 and 20% uh, of their revenue on Android. So it's amazing that, so I hope it will change. And uh, the good news is that uh, I tried to, to put my apps, it was a $3 apps, and I, I, put, uh, I set the price to $5. Uh, as an experiment, but actually it, it worked. So it worked. Uh, there was more revenue, and uh, so I think the good news it has in has in all markets uh, or for all products. If your product is uh, recognized as a good one, you can sell it uh, at a good price. And I, I hope it will continue. And very good apps, you will be able to sell it uh, at a better price. Um, also, uh, I'm doing ed educational apps, and uh, I saw some uh, good news in, because I saw some uh, new player. Are, for example, I remember um, uh, an app for uh, an ABC app called Meta for Meta for Meta. Metamorph a bit. Yeah, it's pretty complex. Yeah. It's not a good marketing <laughs> name, but uh, <laughs> but anyway, I still see this app in the charts. So I think it's uh, it's really new. It's really uh, I think. When you have uh, apps that are really engaging kids, uh, words of mouth is really working. And there was also Earth, uh, a premier, that was uh, ex really expensive app, but really nice, and it's still in the chart. So I think there is some, the good news is that if you do a really innovative apps, and, uh, it's, uh, it, it can work, but, uh, but you, you have to, to, to give something really new really, and where kids are. Uh, really happy with and parents too, of course. <laughs> I was able to pull some good news and some bad news out of that line. Scott? Oh yeah, definitely. There's some good nuggets in there. Uh, it's interesting. I mean, because there's there's many different ways that we can we can many different directions we can take this conversation. Of of interest here is some folks think you know. We're standing at the doorstep of a huge opportunity here in the app space for kids. Others think it could be a mature marketplace. And, and I, I asked myself, well, yeah, you know, it does seem like, you know, we finally got a lot of 
the, the, the groundwork in place where the industry could really take off. But yet there's other research in other industries, like I, I remember reading this uh, Morgan Wedbush uh, research about the, the great console myth. Every eight years, the industry churns and reinvents itself. And I sometimes wonder if the same thing is happening in the kids' app space, maybe a little earlier. Um, you know, uh, so this, I, I'm curious uh, that we could be at the, the dawn of a, of a new um, future for kids' apps. And I look at how the television industry, the traditional television industry is struggling and how it's becoming more digital. How the textbook industry is struggling and trying to reinvent itself. And the toy industry is cursing that they're not in digital. Right? I mean, these are all kid trends. And I wonder, well, are you placing all your bets in the app space for kids? Are you looking at other places to diversify what you're offering just in kids or in any other kind of industry? Maybe that's too long of a question, but I've often wondered, is, do, does the kids' app world need more diversification into other media types? I, I think there's a... <clears throat> A lot of questions. Yeah, sorry. In that question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think one of the defining um, things we have in the, in the kids app industry is uh, something called platform risk, which is also common with the console industry. Mm -hmm. um, and everybody in this room faces significant platform risk. If you are waiting for the deck to turn on a Thursday night in the hope that you are promoted, um, then you need to find another route to market because it is not a solid basis from which to build a business. Um, if you are entirely dependent on you know, one of three organizations, really, um, to um, create your success for you. Um, and one of the, certainly one of the things we've been struggling with in Story Toys is, how do you break that cycle? Um, I, I'm, I'm of the games industry. Um, you know, we've never seen in that industry, we always said, well, how do we get direct to the consumer? How do we... Um, you know, ensure that um, we can be the masters of our own destiny. And uh, something we're struggling with in Story Toys at the moment as well, how, how can we create a lifetime value-based uh, business model that is independent of the, of the app stores to, to succeed? So I, I'm not on the, the, the platforms are mature to, you know, to an extent. Um, I don't think the market is mature. And I don't think the market can mature until we see players that are, are addressing that, uh, that question in, in some way. There's high penetration of devices, but there's a lot of noise out there uh, on the store. We haven't seen a, a classic market shakeout yet. And we, we, need to, we need to see that before we'll see uh, players of scale, I think. Yeah, I think it's really interesting, the question about whether the market is mature or not. Um, I think I would disagree strongly that it's a mature market. Um, I think the only way in which you can consider it as a mature market is for what um, people conceive to be children's apps as they currently are. Um, I think if you think about apps in the more general context of where technology is going and where um, games are going and where the technology that underpins um, home entertainment and games are going, then it's not really a mature market uh, at all. Um, it's wide open, I think. I think the other sense in which it's not mature either is that um, in a mature market you tend to have um, really strong brands and it's brand identification that's at the core of that. And that's only starting to emerge in the app market at the moment. Um, our experience, um, a bit like Story Toys and other companies, is that we are trying really, really hard to escape from platform dependence um, to develop our own brand and develop our own marketing channels directly to our target audience. And I think when that really kicks in, that's when you start to see maturing in, in the market. We don't have to go down the line in terms of format. Um, you know, this, this is not as much of a panel, and I want to just say that this is a chapel. It's a place of worship. It also be, could quickly turn into a place of sleep. And so if you want to get out and get a cup of coffee and a cookie, that's perfectly good. Kids, you're being awfully quiet and good. I'm suspicious. 
Um, and uh, feel free to jump in. Uh, but Harley, you were going to say something. Uh, on the subject of diversification, um, so we do about 70% uh, transformational educational games and about 30% uh, pure entertainment games, and we do that very deliberately. Um, we want to make sure that we are uh, well versed in what's happening in the entertainment space and that we can use those techniques to make sure that our engagement levels with our transformational educational games are high. But also, uh, one of our core company values is this notion that diversity makes us strong, and that's in terms of the kinds of experiences we create, the clients and partners that we work with, the people that we hire, um, we look for ways to diversify all of those things all of the time um, because there's a lot of stuff happening uh, and we want to make sure that we are really competent in as many areas as possible because uh, I don't think anybody really knows where the market is going. Um, I would agree that uh, while our products seem to have matured as, a, as an industry, our market hasn't. And uh, I think that in the next couple of years, we're going to see um, something shake out. Um, my guess is that it's going to be about curation, uh, possibly um, new kinds of stores um, or uh, subscription models. Uh, but that's the sort of thing that we want to be well positioned for. Um, it's important to note that for any of those services that are doing curation or subscription models, that they are going to want to have some kind of defensible assessment system. And again, when we're talking about apps for kids, a lot of times we're talking about making stuff that teachers can use in the classroom. They want lesson plans, they want curriculum, they want classroom management strategies, and they want it to align to the standards that they're responsible for making sure that their kids are meeting. And that's not something that you can do uh, by guessing and going with your gut. You need to do a lot of research in order to be able to, to do that. I want to throw something out uh, that three months ago, YouTube Kids launched. And uh, YouTube Kids, uh, when I started to play with it, I realized just how incredibly powerful uh, that experience was for, it specifically targets kids, but you can basically search with your voice, it eliminates typing for good, and say any topic, and it gives you a, a real answer. And I tried bass fishing, I tried 1937 Chevy, I tried uh, sh play Mr. Rogers Neighborhood, and I showed the videos to uh, Rick Fernandez of the, uh, at the Rogers Center, and his jaw just dropped open, and he realized that, you know, all the content is there on YouTube Kids. And that's one home button away from your app. So all of a sudden, with the release of one app, you've got a, a multi-million channel television set that you've got to compete with. And I'm just wondering, you know, that your comments about curation, uh, what is this going to do? And maybe the biggest enemy could be that it's other forms of media are creeping into the same pipeline that you're using to try to deliver interactive. Uh, so anyway, I just want to throw that out there because I think that's a key, key event that just happened. Um, so Warren, you asked me to speak tomorrow and I think I'm actually gonna, my comment now is gonna be the conclusion for my talk tomorrow. So it might spoil it a bit because it leads in so <coughs> low from where you're at. Um, I don't think the fight is about dollars anymore. I think the fight is about time. It's the exact same thing that Warcraft did in the video game business and it obliterated the video game business when it just sucked away all the time from all the other video games. And I think the exact same thing is going to start to happen in apps. And it's not even just apps, it doesn't matter if it's TV or if it's YouTube or whatever it happens to be. It's not about how, much, how many dollars you can get, the question is how much time can you get someone to be engaged with your product or family of products. Because if you're not in that mix, you're not going to get seen, you're not going to get the cross marketing and all the rest of it. And on the point of diversity, I'll add that you know we've done a lot of apps so that we have a large financial base, and only half of our apps are in the kids space. What I've learned is that the more we target a very, very, very specific uh, micro niche and nail it perfectly, the more money we're able to make. The more we try to go broad with what we do, 
the more competition there is and the harder it is and the more of a knife fight it becomes. So actually we make a lot more money with some of our apps that are very, very niche focused and things outside of kids, you know, without getting into numbers, some of that stuff ends up being on par with some of the Dr. Seuss stuff. It's amazing. So if uh, Darren, for example, has an app he just released with seven different activities, one of them is Venn diagrams. If he took just the Venn diagrams and marketed it just as that, it might be a smart move. It could be, but the question is how many other apps on the App Store are targeting Venn diagrams and where does his app rank out of those, if he's the best Venn diagram app on the App Store. And you store, nail it. That's you the key. Nail it, you said nail it. Then you're at the top. Right? If you're not number one or number two in any given category, you don't even need to play. Right? That's a famous business saying. I can't even remember exactly who said it. But the same is true with every little micro niche on the App Store. Um, okay, so from the independent developer standpoint, um, I, I felt it necessary a couple years ago to branch out to other platforms, and so now I support uh, iOS and Android. Uh, I switched to Unity to uh, keep my development time low. Uh, my philosophy is just have zero expenses, and uh, that's how I'm surviving. <laughs> Um, on diversification, um, absolutely, we're doing that. Um, partly, partly fueled by a realization of market size, but more that uh, it was always the intention um, to do that. And it's just we felt that we built a, um, a brand in this in the touchscreen space, which I think we can keep going with, but always had the intention to make something bigger than anything. So it's happening. Yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about it later. Happy to talk more about it afterwards. Uh, video being one of the first places which we're going to enter in a bigger way. Um, I think on the sort of this, the shakeout thing, um, I think it's going to start this year. And that's my sense. Um, very, very strong indication that you're either doing really well or terrible. That's, the, that's what I'm hearing anyway from people. So I could see a lot of consolidation happening this year and people either sort of doubling down or giving up. Um, might not be entirely a bad thing for the market as a whole necessarily, but it's going to be a few individual tragedies which are going to be bad, of course. Um, I think sort of on a macro level, everyone here is in the perfect possible space. So is it reasonable to assume, is what I keep sort of as a mantra in my own mind, like is it reasonable to assume that kids are going to have an increased access to touchscreen based devices and use that for entertainment and education over the coming five to ten years? That is one of the safest bets you could ever make, I would argue. Mm -hmm. However, we have to make it until five to ten years from now. <laughs> that's the tricky thing. And that's where the consolidation is going to come in, in my opinion. Uh, like you've got to make it until this new leap that you were referencing before. What is that leap? It's a little unclear. It seems that we're in the right area-ish, but we've got to make it to that point. And I think survival until whatever that new business model is, new marketplace, new platform maybe, whatever it may be, that's going to be the tricky thing. So there's going to be, have to be a bit of a shake-up before we get to that. So on a global scale, the number, the installed base is increasing every day. And Moore's Law is making it so the price of hardware is dropping. We can expect Apple to probably drop a little bit. Uh, the Mini gives you a gateway, that the iPad Mini, that's $250 now. You can get a, a new device that gives you access to all these things. And that this can only be a good thing. And one of the themes here is that how do we start to expand? If you look at the total number of children on the planet Earth right now who are alive, and there's a very small percentage that currently have multi-touch devices that can access some of the higher quality apps. So that there is a, a potential market. Uh, supply and demand rules could, could be there. And that, that's got to be good news, correct? In my, in my mind, it's great news, but again, you've you got to make it until then. You can, you can wait, you can see the future and sort of see that you're on, on the right track, but you've got to have enough gas in the tank to, to get all the way sort of thing. I think that's going to be the challenging thing for a lot of developers anyway. Um, and that, that could lead to this sort of, it could lead to, you know, some interesting collaborations or mergers and all sorts of things, I suppose, as well. It doesn't necessarily have to be people going out of business, just it probably won't look the same, that's all. Uh, I'm pretty, um, I, I share your, your view about micro niche because I, I did a, you know, one of my successful app is an app to learn to write, to write letters. And uh, 
what I, I was thinking about is say, yeah, uh, you have to keep this, this app is working, so you have to make it better and better and better to stay at the top and to be one. Because I'm a one guy company, so I can I cannot do diversification or, or things like this. I just have to stay the best for one micro, micro niche, yeah. and it will be great for me and to be a, a sustainable business. So. Um, so I agree, uh, that, that's what I think also. I want to stay and do something very good and stay good for in, in this micro, micro niche and continue. And as for schools also, I didn't speak about it, but yeah, I see more and more so educational sales on the App Store. And uh, I hope it, is a, it, it will be a bigger, bigger and bigger market. And the issue and the feedback I've got is the same is uh, how it how, it, uh, how I can put this app into my curriculum, how I can deal with uh, the reports. I want to share all the reports for, from several apps and how to show. Some people, for example, they ask me to have a PDF report because they can export uh, the report in another app, an app that are shared when they can check all the re reports of different apps for each kid. So, uh, yeah. We, we've heard from the pulpit. I think it's time to hear from the congregation. Would you, would you like to ask the question to the uh, folks here? Sir. So, Warren, um, I was actually just gonna ask Mark. Um, are these the same kinds of, uh, I guess, statements and arguments that you heard uh, around the time you would have said the CD-ROM market matured, um, because you, you, you've you spoken at length at this and other occasions about this being a mature market, and everybody has opinions as to why it's not yet a mature market, but I guess I'm wondering how familiar does the, all, of, all of the arguments that people are making sound? Well, a lot of what people are saying is true. As Barry said, there, we haven't had the big fallout of the consolidation yet. We haven't uh, stepped over into publishers yet. You know, will Token Boca publish other people's stuff, like Broderbund used to publish other people's stuff. It sort of became uh, publishing houses for a while. And, or David said there was a, quite a few good companies that came and went. When um, we were arguing about doing CD-ROM, CD-ROM had a minute seek time when you clicked on something. And uh, trying to talk, you know, I talked Broderbund into spending a million dollars on development on a product that was, for a product that was, a market that was non-existent. But when it came out, it's what took them public, and then we turned it into a $30 million a year business for a string of years, and we're just cooking along until the market saturated. The big companies all went, they were selling everything cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, and the whole market collapsed in one year. And in a year, everybody was bought and sold, <clears throat> and, and all those titles and companies just went away. In, in a year and a half, it was like, you know, we just made $100, $100 million and then bang, you know. And uh, I don't think that we're, this is bigger in a way because it's more mature in, in that, in that we're, we're going farther than it was. So, I, and I agree with all of your statements. I just see that when you have a new market, a little developer can come in, a garage developer can come in and make something and, and, and uh, make, you know, we used to watch, uh, uh, you think back to um, Bill Atkinson, when the Mac was new, and his neighbor was Amanda Goodenough, and he, he built HyperCard, and he made HyperCard come out for free. Apple wanted to charge a bunch of money for it, and he said, no, if you, if you don't give this away for free, I'm gonna put it on every bulletin board and everybody will have it. He was a very revolutionary, because he wanted people to have authoring tools. And his neighbor did a little story about her cat called Kyoko, dream or something like that, which was like really simple um, links and sound effects. And she would reproduce the discs at home and she sold 250000 at $60 a pop at the beginning of a new market out of her kitchen. And, and, that, and we saw that happen in the CD-ROM market. We've seen this happen, you know, in the products that you could put out in the app market five years ago, even my title, would have made a lot more money if I'd done it two years beforehand. And so that's that thing about the mature market, it's just that it's flooded with a lot of noise and it's much harder. And the niche market, I think, is really, um, really true. Who was, yeah. was talking about yeah. the niche market? Yeah. That, that, you know, it turns out that the biggest sales for noodle words is speech language pathologists. And they 
they promoted to all the other speech language pathologists. Now we didn't really intend to do that, but what do you need? We'll help you. You know. So um, I, it's there's so many things changing as we we can't tell what's coming exactly. So it's we're kind of all make bets on what's the best way to go. So the metaphor of waves is a good one because you caught a wave at Broderbund and you surfed it and you were on the top. Uh, Steve Jobs came out with the uh, Macintosh and rode a wave of the visual interface. Uh, the iPhone caught a wave and you know it's everywhere, it's huge. So you can, uh, if, if, you, if you can understand magic and the, the laws of engagement and you catch the wave and you can connect the dots, you can do very well. But I think the trick, I think what I'm picking up now is the, it isn't big waves anymore. It's a lot of little ripples and it's a windy space and you know it's pretty tough out there and there's sharks swimming around. And so there's still waves, but you better, you, and you better know where they are, but if you get between them, you can drown. And the thing that I would add to that, having been through two waves myself, is it's actually easier to make money at the beginning of the wave than it is later. So as much as, you know, three years ago, we were sitting here saying, wow, it's so hard to make money in the app space. I wish I could roll the clock back to three years ago, because I'd actually be putting in the 100 hours, because it's, it's gotten a lot harder. Um, and I can relate to it from the video game, and Mark and I know each other from back at that time. I mean, the first Journeyman Project game that we did in 91, we spent $70,000 on. Two years later, we spent $400,000 on its sequel, and two years after that, we spent $1.8 million on the, on the third one in the series. So the same kind of thing hap starts to happen in apps, right? You have to invest more, you have to get to a higher bar, because that's what the market is demanding, but at the same time, it's not that the revenues are necessarily in line with that kind of growth. So the margins get squeezed as you're spending more. Even though this market's larger, it's actually getting harder and harder to get decent ROI. It was a lot easier two, three years ago. So that's why you look at the beginning of a new market yeah. as an opportunity to step in. Andre? Um, trying to put together some of the things that you guys have said. And some of them has stuck to me. And one of them uh, uh, is basically about curation and the time that, that people have. I think that, we're, that there's this huge glut right now of apps, videos, uh, uh, everything. There's, there's this huge quantity of everything. And you don't have enough time uh, to use all that. So, curation becomes more important. And if you look at who's doing curation well, you get people, for example, like Netflix, uh, who kind of try to see what you like and then offer you more. Uh, or even Amazon, the store, where if you've bought this, this, and this, you're probably going to want more or restock. So how can we take control of curation from these huge companies and build our own curation en uh, engine that is based on how good a product actually is instead of the several different uh, marketing or, or business uh, factors that, that will go into curation if we let it to the big guys. And you're, you're currently making money from YouTube. Yes, uh, yeah. Because you kind of curate and you figured out a way to well, get... curate. You figured out a way to, to let pirates market for you. Do you want to explain? They did, they did actually. They, YouTube did. Uh, yeah, well, well, in my case, it's, or in, uh, in YouTube's case, uh, if I put on, if I put up uh, uh, a television show or a program on YouTube um, that is mine, and I tell YouTube that it's mine, uh, even if a hundred different pirates put on pieces of that same content, um, I'll get the money for it, so I don't have a financial interest of getting those guys off of YouTube. And that's why YouTube exists. Otherwise, uh, Paramount, Sony, Warner will all have taken everything off of YouTube a long time ago, and YouTube would never have grown because of all the legal actions. So YouTube actually uh, respects uh, uh, and, and, and pays uh, the, the, whoever owns the, the IP. But of course, it keeps the lion's share for itself. Uh, but what I'm saying is, how can I say that? Well, if you like these apps, 
Uh, somehow, I think you have a three-year-old that is learning this and this, this skill. You're probably going to like these apps. Um, and if you do, you're going to like these videos. Uh, or this kind of program. Or go to the movie and watch this. Like, how do I tell these people uh, uh, in a realistic way how, uh, what, what they should look for? Because if we leave it up to the Apple Store or if we leave it up to Netflix or so on, they have a vested interest on their curation. And they'd never give us the secret sauce of how it's, how it's done. And somewhere in there, there's always someone who's paying. There's like with YouTube, there's always, who's generating more advertising for me? This guy's gonna bubble up. I love the answer, I have a good question. I don't have the answer for you. <laughs> but what I would say is that, uh, you know, cur curation in some ways is a form of intermediation. And one of the things that the App Store did was disintermediate uh, the developer from, you know, from the market. And that in itself was its biggest opportunity, but also now is currently the biggest threat because it is, you know, distribution is, is very, very easy. So you're relying on curation um, of the App Stores. Um, you're relying on... Um, you're relying on, on, on you know, th those app stores to promote that content. And, you know, if you bring about, if you say, let's try to get a curated service, then that service in itself will be um, exclusive. Um, and there will be people in this room that will be unhappy that they're not included um, on that service. If people in this room try to put a service together, they will not come to agreement on how we can build a service that will make money for everything, for everybody, because simply there's not enough money to go around uh, for everybody. So you kind of create the publisher issue again, um, whereby you know, there's a, a small number of players are gathering most of the revenues from, you know, from the market. Just one quick comment on that. <clears throat> I think in many ways we are kind of expecting external curation to do the job that we need to be doing, which is building strong brands which curate themselves essentially. Um, where people come to trust a brand and trust the products and message from, from that brand. And that, that's a sign of a, a maturing market when, when that happens. I've got something to follow up there. All right. I'll take it over here. Thank you for bringing that up because I can't help but notice, you know, all of your companies are relatively young. And, you know, you're competing against the likes of Nickelodeon. Disney, Scholastic, EA, you name it, giants in the industry. And you are, you know, you're the Davids and they're the Goliaths, but yet, you know, you're growing a business. And one of the things I wonder about with smaller companies that are succeeding, you know, what kind of effort are you putting into your brand development and the thinking behind your brand? Granted, you're probably looking to increase your portfolio, but I, I would imagine you're spending a lot of time thinking about your brand building as well. Anyone could talk about their thoughts on how they're building their brand and recommendations for others? <laughs> we'll rush this down to, to Tokoboka. Uh, yeah. Notice the backdrop, by the way. I'm branding we... as we speak. Check out that patent. This is very <laughs> subliminal. <laughs> Have you tattooed any children yet, Bjorn? Uh, I get can't believe some tattoos just now. Yeah, see? He's already got you, see, huh? That, that's, that's how you do it. <laughs> Always bring tattoos to a conference. Um, Literal branding. Yeah, exactly. No, we were very intentional efforts, um, very consistent, and something which has been a high priority, both in terms of time and investment, since even before we wrote code. We had our brand set up before we wrote the first line of code, um, and it's just been a priority. It's very difficult. It's a very very specific skill set um, and one which does not naturally come to anyone who is a good software developer. So like <laughs> that is just it should be respected as a, as a skill and as a you know traits that are very unique and, and very but very very well needed. So you've got to find people that can match up uh, on the other end of things and take that as serious as, as the development part if you're in the long run are going to build this brand I think. Um, We've done a lot of activities um, to, that are very hard to tell whether they are immediately ROI positive, but everything thinking that it's going into this brand, which is 
potentially madness <laughs> or a way of, of, of sort of justifying spending money on things which you don't see a return on, but could also be the most valuable investment I've ever done. It's hard to tell. Jury's still out on that one. Um, but at least in terms of a strategy and in terms of my primary app store discovery tool, my brand is that. That has always been that, and I, I, I foresee in the coming few years it's still going to be that. I can't see anything else that could trump the value of my brand, if it, if it, even from the most sort of tactical app store discovery, how do I get someone to download Toga Kitchen 2 aspect? I still think the brand would do that better than most other things that I've tried, and I've tried a lot of stuff. <laughs> So we've obviously looked at brands a lot as well, but we've done it from the sense of uh, each individual product can have a strong brand. Uh, you know, Disney, I think certainly people go to the, the um, App Store and search for Disney, but I think they're a lot more likely to go to the App Store and search for Frozen or whichever character mm -hmm. they're looking for. Same would be true for Nickelodeon or whoever it happens to be, even Sesame Street, you know, kids are going to type in Elmo instead. Um, so. Um, and then all we, all we try to do is we just try to maintain our quality with all of our apps. And by, by affiliating ourselves with those brands, we hope to lift ourselves up to sort of piggyback. And if we figure if we do that long enough for enough years with enough good high quality brands and maintain the quality, then it'll slowly bubble up. But it's a different strategy. We're not going anywhere near as, as hardcore as what Tokoboka is. Uh, so we... Uh, really try to be on the pioneering edge of development. Uh, we try new things all the time. Uh, and, and so we focus on trying to do things that nobody's done before, or put things together that nobody's put together before, and then we, and then we do that at the highest possible quality. Uh, and one of the things that we have noticed is that when one thing hits just a little bit, all the other things that we've done also hit a little bit more than they have been. Um, that combined with the fact that, you know, we don't make games to make money, we make money to make games, gives us a pretty strong strategy of uh, sort of husbanding away money so that we can take a real uh, IP risk and do something uh, that we find really interesting uh, and put that out there and see how it does. And if it doesn't do well, uh, bad things aren't actually going to happen. Um, it has been uh, pretty successful for us in terms of helping find our players and find the voice that our players want to hear the most. So. Well, you asked about companies like Nickelodeon and Disney and David and Goliath. Um, I, I think it's, uh, there are two sides to it. I, I'm, I'm kind of a critic of Nickelodeon, that's kind of, I don't know. Don't get me started. But uh, <laughs> yeah, Nickelodeon has their own TV channel, so they can you know, advertise their apps on their own channel. They have tons of money. Uh, but I don't particularly think the quality is very good. So like, name a Nickelodeon app that's better than Pierre's Word Wizard. Sure, sure. So <laughs> you know, I, I, don't, I don't see them as some big Goliath that we have to overcome. So there. <laughs> good. Um, go ahead, Mark. Or, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I think I would really echo that. I think um, the big companies, in my experience, really, really suffer from lack of imagination and suffer from the the vast um, brand history that they have that they have hanging around their necks already, and that that limits their ability to innovate and to think imaginatively. And I really don't see them as they, they compete for attention um, and space, but they don't compete, I believe, on a, on a creative level. Just add, add on the brand side piece. Um, for a lot of large entertainment companies, apps are a necessary merchandising, necessary part of their merchandising mix. They need to be in the app space. For companies like Electronic Arts, who aren't in the kids' app space, the market opportunity is too small. It's a fundamental fact. There's a small opportunity when you compare it to that of uh, uh, bigger video game opportunities for them. So there's no EA Sports. It's in the game. On your iPad. No. Well, it's all there, but it's games. It's not children's apps. Uh, how are we doing on time? Um, 
we should probably move along to pretty soon to Bjorn, but I think we we could drop one drop one more, and I'm sure there's some millions of comments. There we, um, there's there's one there. A very eager hand. Yeah. Let's right let's ahead. address that eager hand. Go ahead. Yeah, so uh, iPad sales have kind of uh, have negative growth for five quarters year over year. Um, is that a concern to any of you guys? Negative iPad growth, is that a concern for you guys, last five quarters? So TouchPress, um, certainly in the first couple of years of our five-year existence, was synonymous with the iPad. Um, and clearly that kind of trend is a trend that we've been very aware of. And um, <coughs> the way we see it is the differentiation between phone and tablet is gradually um, becoming less obvious um, and I think because the phones are becoming higher resolution and um, in many cases they are taking the place of the traditional tablet and so phones are becoming dual purpose devices and our strategy is much more to make sure that our apps um, work well on the complete range of resolutions and respond to the particular device rather than thinking about designing apps for a particular format. Mark, you yeah. I had something before, but I'm, well, I'm waiting to hear Sean, so. Yeah, we, <laughs> we, we should start wrapping. Um, I, I was just going to real quick, I just think there was a big rush on iPad sales in the beginning and you just had to have it, right? And I mean, a lot of kids and a lot of families and um, I just don't think people are replacing them as fast as they are with phones. I just don't think it matters that much. Um, so the install base is there, it's still growing, it's just growing at a slower rate than it was in the beginning. And I, I just think it's okay, it's just not the shiny new object that it was years ago. When I look in this viewfinder and I see who's in it, I um, quickly understand that you are the people who will make whatever happens in the next year and also. And I, uh, right now, Google, the Google conference is finishing and Apple's is next week. And um, these are obviously the wave makers. Is there one thing that you would like to say to the, these two big, mega stores about what they could do to better support children's app makers. This, this might be a time. Maybe I can get this video up before Apple starts. And in full disclosure, there are no Apple employees in this audience. They're all busy getting ready for WW, whatever it is. <laughs> well, look where the microphone just might be. Sure, that's fine. <laughs> um, so I've got a pet peeve that's been an issue with the App Store that's still on App Store today. I just think that the books category in general is still a mess, mm -hmm. whether it's an ebook or a book app, and I just don't think people understand the difference. And if they're going to, if Apple really and Google are going to leave them as separated as they are, a search should cross search both of them, and the the you know it should be in their interest to help to educate the consumer what the difference is between the two. Um, and it's been a big impact for us in our business and probably, I'm guessing, for a lot of other folks that are actually doing kids' books. And I might add that a very specific, uh, uh, manageable, kind of, I mean, very specific feedback would be like that. It's perfect because that, that's something that should be done and could be done if they put resources behind it. Absolutely could be done. Any, anybody else? That's what I was going to say. Get, get the kids category back on the home page. Get the key and, and iTunes. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Steam had this thing happen where Greenlight was really great for a while, and then suddenly everybody could get anything they wanted on Greenlight, and you couldn't find anything, and it was terrible. And so then they they launched curation, where people that you admired would would were able to curate their own collections, and suddenly it made sense again. And I think that they could certainly take a page from Valve there. Thank you. Anybody else? Bjorn? Tiny thing which I think would make a lot of difference, which actually is just a tiny feature which exists on iTunes Music but not on the App Store, which is um, a, an opt-in possibility to get 
pinged in some sort when that publisher releases a new app. Mm. So if Madonna releases a new album, I'll get a notification saying, you like Madonna, here's Madonna's new album, are you interested? No, no force to purchase or anything, just a question. That already exists. On the topic of building a brand, like, if people find my apps, if they know that it's out and they like it, chances are they might buy it. If they're not in the app store that week, chances are they won't find it, and that's the problem. But they might have, had they been notified, Again, in an opt-in manner and, and, and all, but that's a very tiny, tiny tweak. Now that's, a, that's Apple specifically. Yeah, but that would be a, make a big difference for anyone, anyone who's consistently launching multiple And products Google's not doing that year. either. Uh, it, there's, there's so much to be done just on the initial discoverability, which is tiny, tiny things that should make a big, big difference. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent, Excellent feedback. Yeah, I think I would echo that. Um, something that we have been consistently asking Apple about is the ability to communicate with our audience. Um, and it's not that we want to mail shot that audience directly, but we would love a way for us to be able to um, let our App Store audience know what's happening um, and to be able to mark market to them and we feel that that would be very much in Apple's interest as well because it's consistent with, with them. But while they keep a very tight wall between developers and the actual individuals who buy our apps, that makes marketing ever so much more difficult. Thank you. I think uh, something that, uh, that's present in, in Google Play but not in the App Store is the ability to respond to reviews. Yeah. Uh, that yeah. would be absolutely critical. It's been very, very important on Google Play. Um, and uh, then, you know, also we'd like the ability to drive a user directly towards the review page, um, as opposed to this convoluted method at the moment. That would be great. Great. These are very specific things. Uh, Anne. I'd like it if the search worked better in the App Store or the iTunes Store, because if you put Reader B, you can't find it. You have to put a space between the words. And our site, of course, is ReaderB.com. So, you can Google it, but you can't find it in Apple. And I find that very frustrating. Even if people are looking for it, they can't find it. Yeah, iTunes search is terrible. It, it's it's terrible. terrible. And, and it's really, really so basic. And the, the character limit that you have for your, um, for your keywords, uh, all of that stuff, things like the not being intelligent enough to detect whether there should be an S on the end of a word or not, or mm -hmm. give you those variations. It's, it's, a, it's search in its infancy. Is, is Google's better? Way, 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 way better. So Google knows something about search. Hmm. <laughs> I think one of the other things is uh, that you'll notice with the new Google Play for Families is there's now a filter on that search. So if you're in Play for Families and you search, it will only show you family friendly applications and it's just removed a lot of clutter from, uh, from those search results. So it's positive growth. That was, last year we were quite down on Google Play. Is it any better this year? Well, we'll, well I think the time to ask is next year. <laughs> for, for you. Because you just came out with a, uh, quite a few, or some major apps, including my Very Hungry Caterpillar and Google Play. Is it going to work? We help them. Emma? Yes. <laughs> okay, guys. Well, we have, uh, it gets late fast. This is Sunday night. We've all traveled. And um, again, this, uh, having this group here is very, very special. And I think we just, uh, we're just getting started in the theory of disequilibration. Our job was to confuse you. I think you did a great job of co confusing everybody. Um, however, we'll start putting the pieces together and connecting dots. Keep your eyes and ears open have some coffee. We're going to take a stretch and get Bjorn up here. I'd like you to give these guys a round of applause because they're doing great work. Before you go, before you go, could everybody take your right arm please and give everyone on, on your right side a, pa a pat on the back because you're all doing good work. And the other way please. Good work. Change the world.